We have a couple of announcements this morning. First of all, right after the service, um, uh, I'm going to do the benediction and then ask you all to be seated. And we have a four plus a few seconds um, video on the AED, a refresher on how to use it. We have a lot of folks with heart problems, and it just is a good thing if everybody knows how to use it if something happens. So um, it's only four minutes, so I hope you all will just stay seated and, and let George run the video. I have an uh, announcement for loaves and fishes. The next loaves and fishes is scheduled for April 7th. Dale and I will be away that week. If you're available to help prepare or serve the meal, please let us know. Thank you for your support. So I would imagine that they would like to know pretty soon so that they can leave it uh, in the capable hands of whoever volunteers. I will be away on vacation from the 27th to the 7th. And um, the week I'm away is Communion Sunday and Dwight will be preaching and officiating. So. Um, I hope that you all will come to see him. There's a lot of illness in the church, but I think also fear of the snowstorm we were supposed to get has kept a lot of people away this morning. So look around and see who's not here and make sure you get in touch with them just to be sure, okay? That's all the announcements I have, but I know Diana wants to talk about Easter baskets. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. You can hear me without it, I'm sure. Um, I think we are in really good shape. I was just over there and brought my last few things that I purchased. Um, if there's anything that I think we could use would be some crayons, because I bought some of those um, books that you can kind of color with colored pencils, and I bought some funny little happy face books. But I got colored pencils for all of them, thinking the kids would think that was kind of cool. But I didn't get crayons. So I'm thinking if anybody would like to volunteer to pick up from the dollar store um, about a dozen packs of crayons, that would probably be all we need. Um, I've just taken a toll and I went out, last Saturday I was out for two hours at the dollar store picking out and trying to make sure that I had enough of everything that we needed, and I think we're in really good shape. And you have a volunteer right over there, the red sweater behind Maxine. Okay. Okay, okay good. Other than that, is there anybody who said they were going to bring something that they haven't yet? Because I think we're covered. Okay. Anybody wants to take a dander over there? It looks like we got a really nice And you're putting, to, yeah, putting them together uh, yeah, on the from March. Okay. Um, I have signs and ribbons and tags and there's baskets and buckets and not that grass and okay. stuff, so we're good. And Thank other you. announcements real quick that you didn't write down. There is paper in the back that Diana brought in for us to do it, but then again, she didn't write hers either, so. <laughs> <laughs> Sherry. Um, we paid $101 from book sale. It ends on Wednesday, so maybe we'll see how high we get. And I'm going to be donating the rest of the books to Mount Zion Church for their book. All right. And also, next Sunday is Adam Shealy's Eagle Ceremony after the service. Between church and Adam's ceremony, there will be light refreshments to kind of tie people over. Right. Where at, Sherry? Over there. Okay. That place. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. There's baskets in the back, one says shelter. The baskets in the back, one says shelter, and one says food, so let's get them filled. Okay. And um, these things, if they're going past like mid-March, make sure you get a little write-up to Linda to put in the newsletter, because she'll be starting that this week. All right. That's the end of our announcements, and today we have a special uh, peace to our service, and that is the blessing of the um, Project Blindness Blankets. <clears throat> I put one up here on the altar. Um, 
I would like whoever has worked on the blankets to stand and just kind of come around where they are. Come on, you know who you are. I'm Maxie. <laughs> Maxie made most made, of these. He made everything else. So cool. <laughs> And tell me he did. <laughs> come on, Fanny. Connie? You don't have to say anything. I just want you to come up front. Paula? Karen's not here. Sherry, you do a little bit. Not much. So every little bit counts. Every little well, I mean, like, Connie puts tags on them and, yeah, and washes them. It's all a process. It's not just one individual. And the reason I wanted you all to stand was so that the people could look at the number that you are and look at the 52 yes. blankets that are here today that have been made by a small group of folks. So it just goes to show you how much uh, can be done when a group uh, gets together to do them. And they're lovely. And some very uh, special ones like the... There's balls, and I'm not sure what the other thing on that there's one is. There's a race car one over there, and, and there's, animals. yeah, there's, like, this one has baseballs on it. That's what I was trying to see from Yeah, now. and, like, this one is, um, Look a little bit like kind of looks cats. like strawberry shortcake. Oh, yeah. good. And then I have a friend that I went to beauty school with who makes the Afghans, yeah. and I think some of them was... Also, some of them were from Joyce Applefeld. We happened to find them, and so we took them home and washed them. And it's like some of them are small, but for infants, they're great. But um, the girl I went to beauty school with, she gets bored. So she crochets, so she donates them to me. Great. Yeah, that's awesome. And they're beautiful, all of them. So um, we're going to dedicate these. First of all, we dedicate them to God. Then we dedicate them to um, the people who will be receiving the blankets, um, the individuals, not the um, group. Um, but as you look at these 52 blankets, think about 52 different people being blessed by this church, by these blankets. Shall we pray? Almighty God, we give you thanks for the talent and the time and the vision and the love that went into the creation of all these different blankets, whether they be quilted or hand-stitched or crocheted. Each of these is a beautiful expression of your love that will be wrapped around one individual, mostly children. And these blankets will say, that they came from in the church and that the women who worked on them are giving of themselves as you have asked us to do. So bless these blankets for their use and we dedicate them to you, O oh God, and let the people say, Amen. Amen. After worship, come up and take a peek at them and get a closer look at all the work. Thank you, ladies. You could have just, yeah, I should have said that. Pat, you're on. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, <laughs> this is one of those days where it's your chance to sound like 150. <laughs> Sing loud, whether you're on key or not. Ah, uh, <laughs> first was number 436, freely, freely.
1991, there's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place.
join me in the prayer of confession. You go first. In a world of anxiety, so many things we do not, Lord. We come to this time of temptation. We confess that we are often enticed to follow the way of the world. Forgive us when we hunger for the wealth and power of the world that hangs before us. Move us from greed to gratitude for your blessings. Heal our wounded spirits and lives so that we may be fully serve you. Prepare us for this journey of discipleship and healing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Place your trust in God who will provide for your needs. You are not alone. God is with you always. The world cannot offer to you such abiding riches. Claim your salvation in Christ Jesus. Amen. The first scripture we can go is from the Old Testament. It's Genesis 9, 8 through 17. The covenant with Noah from the New Revised Standard Version. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, As for me, I am establishing my covenant with you and your descendants after you. And with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the domestic animals, and every animal of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark. I establish my covenant with you, that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my vow in the clouds, bow I think, <clears throat> in the clouds, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth, and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you, and every living creature of all flesh. And the water shall never again be a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, This is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. The New Testament lesson is 1 Peter 3, 18-22, and it's from the New Revised Standard Version. For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he also went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison, who in former times did not obey when God waited patiently in the days of Noah during the building of the ark in which a few, that is, eight persons, were saved through water. And baptism, which this prefigured, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal of God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers made subject to him. The word of God the people of God. Thanks be to God. If you would please rise for the gospel. I read from John 3, verses 19 to 21. Again, the new revised standard. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and people love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light, and do not come to the light, so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light, so that 
it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. yesterday and uh, her blood pressure went up to 185. The doctor told her not to uh, do anything as strenuous as coming here. <laughs> <laughs> but she's doing well. I um, just appreciate your concern. Thank you, Dwight. Dwight, let her know that we all love her. Um, I talked with Charlotte Bond on Friday night and um, Charlotte, um, always, always asked how the church members are and what's happening in church. Um, she, again, also misses everybody and loves it when people um, send her cards and remembrances. She's very clear-headed. She's carried on a wonderful conversation. We reminisce a lot. And um, if you remember Charlotte, um, give her a call. She, she, doesn't, she just loves to have somebody to talk to. And even if you don't remember her, you can still give her a call and let her tell you about the church. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, also, um, I guess, um, I don't know if anybody else is going to say anything about Dee, but um, we did go to visit Dee on Friday, and she seemed to be doing very well. Dee um, had her surgery Thursday, for anyone who might not know that. Yes. And although Diane said that... Um, Maybe she's not doing well. Well, Shirley saw her yesterday and was concerned. She was very pale, which she had not been the times we had seen her. But, uh, well, directly after surgery, she looked very well. She did. Um, and um, I suspect that she had a little happy juice on board, whether she knew she had or not. <laughs> <laughs> but um, the fact that she came through the surgery so well is um, is the first thing to give thanks to God for. And then just pray that she continues to improve. She thinks she's going home tomorrow. In her own head, that's the date that she said she's not going home tomorrow. Probably not maybe end of the week, but 
I'm hoping they send her to rehab somewhere so she can get stronger. Because you know if she goes home, she's going to do the same thing most of us would do, go right back to doing what we were doing before. Is she okay with visitors? Yes. yes. Um, do you have a room number? 211. 211 South. 211 South. Okay. Anyone else? I have a, a prayer concern to share with you. I got a call yesterday um, from uh, Ronnie Wikers. Um, she's been ill all last week. Finally gave up and went to the hospital on Thursday where she's been since then. Um, it has something to do with uh, her ileus and um, a gastro problem. Um, she doesn't want visitors, which is why she hasn't told us before now. She wants your prayers, um, cards, things like that. Um, she's not sure when she comes home, but she's hoping for within the next couple of days. So she's at GVMC, and she's weak. And um, when you have those kinds of issues, it's personal why you don't want people there. Um, so um, just hold her in prayer. And um, let her know you're thinking about her in some way. GBMC. Um, GBMC. But I would send cards and things to Clark. Um, she says he's kind of falling apart. So maybe he needs the greetings and the prayers too. Are there others? and this horrible, horrible violence that is going on. And importantly, the mental illness and the mental state of our country and the ability for proper diagnoses and treatment and awareness of what people go through and what they're called to do as a result of that illness. The families down there, there's no way anybody could possibly put themselves in that place. But also in the family of this young man who is so clearly ill, it's just such a travesty. And the, the FBI missed all the reports and all that good stuff. I will point out that for some reason it's the mentally ill young males who are committing these atrocities. There's not yet been a female to do it. So something is going wrong in how we deal with troubled young men, and we need to figure that out. And I'm probably um, not going to be popular with this statement, but I believe that we, our Second Amendments need to be protected, but nobody needs an assault rifle. Nobody needs an assault rifle. Having said that, let's go to God, because we all need um, the divine intervention in our lives and that which keeps us um, on an even heal ourselves and our hearts where they belong. Let us pray. Holy Lord, this morning we come to you in the midst of what should have been a snowstorm, but kind of melted out of danger. We pray for those who didn't come out because they were worried, and we understand that. We pray to you in a church that is half empty because of illness and uh, being away and being ill in a different way than just the flu. And we give you thanks, Lord, that you come to each one of us and whisper in our ears that peace comes only through you, that love has been a gift that we are to continue giving, and that we are to be in action for our brothers and sisters who are hurting, not just sit back and wait to see what happens. This week especially, Lord, this first week of Lent, help us to understand where our sins get in the way of what you want to do in the world and why things happen that we can't understand no matter how hard we try. And help us to know how we can be part of the answer and not continue to be part of the problem. We pray for all 14 youth and three adults who died in that atrocity in Parkland, and we pray for their families as they start the funerals and 
the final goodbyes. And we pray for the students who don't want to go back in that building and who need some sort of direction for their lives. We thank them for their anchor and their ability to speak out. We thank them for the vision that they have and that the call that they are sending to all of us to get up off our duffs and do something besides prayer and good wishes, to be in action. And Lord, we know that's what you call us to do. So help us to understand what action it is we are to take and how we might make a difference. We pray for all those in our community here who are hurting and who are ill. We especially lift to you Dee, and we lift to you uh, Ronnie, and we lift to you all the good things that we've heard about Charlotte and about Shirley, and um, know that the family of Ray is covered in our prayers as well. Help Doris to get stronger so we can have her smiling face back here. And Lord, Whenever we stray, lovingly call us back. Put your hand on our shoulder and your love in our heart and guide us to where we need to be. All these prayers we pray in the name of Christ who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. It is time for us to share our tithes and offerings with our God. So I ask that the ushers for today make their way to the front.
join me in the prayer of dedication. Faithful God, let these gifts be like food and drink in the wilderness for those who have suffered and longed for your presence. May these offerings strengthen those who are resisting temptation and lead us to attend to all who need your healing touch. This we pray in the name of Jesus, our example and Savior. Amen. Our hymn of preparation is 252, When Jesus Came to Jordan. because some days are the Lord's day. So the 40 days are all the other days uh, in Lent. And for Christians, the season of Lent is a time to look deeply at ourselves and to get rid of anything that gets between us and God. And so we do things like prayer and fasting. Only we often pray for things other than to help us remove the sin from our life and fast from things that are 
really meaningless. We do it the easy way, in other words. Did I tell you that my youngest daughter used to give up broccoli? <laughs> she hated broccoli, but every year faithfully gave it up for Lynn. <laughs> That's what I mean about just not quite getting it. The darkness reminds us of the light, and if you look at the screen, the darkness and the light, they're two sides of the same picture, the same thing that God gave us. Darkness in itself is not wrong. It's just that people use darkness to hide um, what they do. And light in itself is not good, except that it helps to show not only what we're doing, but what the whole world is doing. Light is the wonderful creation of God, and it's essential for our happiness and for our survival. For those who suffer from depression when it gets darker, you know what I mean. It's the light that brings us back to feeling uh, like ourselves. And it's with light that we experience the world around us. We can experience a certain amount in the darkness, but it's really the light that shows us where things are happening, what's going on, what we want to be involved in. It's everywhere. It's the conveyor of shape and color. <coughs> Remember in the dark you can't really see much. I have a friend who suffers from, um, yeah, that eye disease. Macular degeneration. Thank you. Macular degeneration. <coughs> and all she can see are dark blobs, not even the shape of a human being. And it's getting progressively worse, so eventually she won't even be able to see that. But the way we help her to see is to make sure there's a lot of light around her, not directly in her face, but around her. That's what the church is to the world, by the way. Light moves faster than anything else. Nothing moves faster than the speed of light. And in the 1960s, the laser beam <laughs> was invented. And the laser shows us how powerful the light is and uh, that nothing really is more powerful than light. It's also a very practical thing. Those of us who like to plant know that it takes uh, light uh, to make the photosynthesis, photosynthesis, the green stuff. <laughs> light picks up water from the sea and wafts it out over the nation and it comes down as rain. We like light. It's a source of joy. When light beams from the sun, it brings smiles to grouchy faces. <laughs> Doesn't it? <laughs> and light feels good to pale bodies laying on the beach, sitting on a chair. I have a friend who just goes out onto her porch to sit fully dressed and let the light bring warmth to her. Just don't overdo it, <laughs> laying on the beach especially. There are times when there's too much light, um, at least in some of our uh, definitions. It exposes those dark corners that we want to keep hidden. Um, it's a bit like those dark places in our houses, you know, the cabinet and the fridge and under the bed, and when they finally do get moved and all the they call them dust bunnies, but they're not dust bunnies. They're downright dirty. <laughs> and when you have pets, uh, even, worse. even worse. And we don't move those things very often to clean them. When was the last time you moved the fridge to clean behind it? It's when I bought it. <laughs> and then you hurry up and sweep what's back there so they can put the new one in, right? Sometimes we're embarrassed by what the light uncovers, especially the dirt and the fact that we haven't cleaned it. And I suppose if we didn't care about the dirt, we would just ignore it and push the furniture back and leave it there for the next person. Some of us pretend we didn't even see it. And that's the metaphor for the darkness of life. There are so many dark corners in our world 
There's the dark world of pornography, abuse, immorality, the dark world of poverty and identity among so many of today's kids, the dark world of war where people are maimed and killed, and it's so easy to pretend that these dark corners don't exist or to look the other way saying that those aren't really our problem. And then Parkland happens and we're reminded it is our problem. In today's text, we're told light has come into the world, but people love the darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Evil defined is against God, against humanity, against the world. An old story tells of a desert nomad who awakened hungry in the middle of the night. He lit a candle and began eating dates. He had a bowl beside his bed full of them. He took a bite from one and saw a worm in it, so he threw it out of the tent. He bit into a second one and he saw another worm, so he threw it out of the tent. And then he thought, if I keep doing this, there won't be any dates left. So he blew out the candle and he ate the dates in the dark. <laughs> Likewise, a room looks a lot neater and cleaner in the dark. In the dark, you can't see the dust and the cobwebs. You can't see the old newspapers thrown aside. You can't see the food squashed into the carpet, especially if you have children, or the dirty marks on the wall. You can't see how gross the curtains are or what condition the furniture is in. The person who owns the room may be someone whom you would expect to be neat and tidy, but turn on the light and all the dirt's exposed. And immediately, you've been given a different picture of the person who lives there. Our truth is, the truth is, Jesus is the light. Jesus is the light of the world. He came into the world not to condemn it, but to bring life. It's only as those dark, private corners of our lives are exposed that we can be helped. It's in the light of God's word that we are faced with the reality that we have dark corners of sin in our lives our lives that need tidying. And we're suddenly shaken by the realization that we too are sinners. Isn't it so neat that we go through life and we talk about all those other sinners? Forgetting that we're all sinners. And then when something gets uncovered, it's like, aha, we are sinners too. Everything's not as neat and tidy as we thought it was. There's a mess that needs to be cleaned up. And even though we've tried to hide the mess in the darkest and most private corner of our lives, the light of Jesus has shown us that there is dirt piled up there and needs cleaning out. And it really is only Christ who can point out where the dirt in our lives is. We may define something as dirt and it's not. But Jesus, Christ, will always let us know Come, says the light of the world. You are my daughter. You are my son. You are forgiven. You are accepted. Come and enjoy light and life. Bask in the beauty and the warmth of the sun, the S-O-N of God. God loves us. And it's free. We didn't do anything to deserve it. And it's freely given, that first praise him freely, freely. But it cost God a great deal. It meant raising up the light of the world on a rough, hewn cross for the world. It meant Jesus making the decision to do as his Father wanted. But in the Gospel of John, states that true glory comes not from prestige, power, fame, or wealth, but from the supreme sacrifice for others. Glory in the coach who threw himself in front of those children. Glory in the teacher who hid so many of the students and was killed himself. Glory in the other adult who tried to stand up to the shooter who's also dead. Glory in the young boy who stood at the door and held it open and got people in the room and was killed himself before he could get safely inside. That's where we see God's glory and what people do 
for other people. And one newscaster said, there is no greater love than to lay down one's life for another. That comes from our scripture and from our Christ who is the light. Freely, the light of forgiveness shines into our lives, lightening up every single corner, forgiving every sin, even the sin of murder. Even the sin of knowing what was happening and ignoring the signs. Even the sin as he looked into the faces of his friends as he shot. Even those sins our Christ forgives. Whoever follows Jesus will not walk in darkness. They will experience the joy and peace of sins forgiven, of new attitudes to work, to school, to leisure, our world, our bodies, <clears throat> and a new relationship with family and friends. When you're hiding something, you can't be truly who you are with the people you love. So, you know what? Still too often we prefer to keep those things in the dark. We pretend, no, it's not there. Everything will be all right. Just wait a few days and it will all pass. We think what no one can see won't hurt us. What is hidden in the dark won't matter. But if you've ever had a little sliver in your finger and you didn't take care of it, what happens? It becomes infectious. And the longer it's there, the more the infection grows. And that's the same way with sin in us. The longer we don't get rid of it, the longer it stays, the more problems it causes. We think that what's hidden in the dark won't matter, but it matters to God. God knows about all those dark corners. God knows about us hiding things in the dark. And God wants us to expose every dark corner to the light of life to Jesus. He's giving to us a light that not only shows up the dirt in our lives, but cleans it away. That's the marvelous part. It cleans it away. What Jesus did for us took care of all that sin. But first we have to acknowledge that it's there and invite Christ to do that cleanup. So here we are at the beginning of the Lenten season. A time of preparation for the passion of our Lord. A time for reflecting on why our Lord had to go to such extremes to save us. Jesus shines his light into our lives. He fills us with his love and forgiveness. He fills us with the joy and knowledge of freedom from guilt for the things that upset us. Comfort for our times of sadness. Joy at the healing we experience between each other. The light that shines in our lives ought to bring blessings to others. We are to let this light of Christ shine through us into the dark corners in the lives of the people around us. Sometimes folks give something up for Lent, like broccoli. <laughs> This year, instead of fasting from some food or drink, I want, you to, I want to suggest to you that you use what the Pope has suggested, Pope Francis. And if we're able to do these things in Lent, perhaps they will become our way of life. So George is going to put them up on the screen, and I have two people who are giving them out, and I will read them as they are on the screen. And the papers that are being given out are purple for Lent, and you are invited to take them home and put them where you can see them every day. And so we fast from hurting words and say kind words. We fast from sadness and be filled with gratitude. We fast from anger and be filled with hope. We fast from pessimism and be filled with hope. We fast from worries and have trust in God. 
We fast from complaints and contemplate simplicity. We fast from pressures and be prayerful. We fast from bitterness and fill your hearts with joy. We fast from selfishness and be compassionate to others. We fast from grudges and be reconciled. We fast from words and be silent so you can listen. These are things I invite you to do this Lent. It doesn't require giving up so much as it requires that you take on, take on a new attitude, a new way of looking at things. So put them, put this list where you can see it. Put it where you can pay attention to it. Make it a central part. For me, it's always on the refrigerator. I see whatever's in the refrigerator that way. <laughs> Our closing hymn is the Spirit Song. We're going to sing that, and then I will do the benediction, and then if you will sit back down for the review of the AED. Please rise and start your posture.
Let that light come into you, sink into you, become a part of you, so that you can let that go and let God in. Go in peace, and may the peace of God go with you. Amen. Please be seated. Amen. Microphone.